Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, May the 5th, 2017, Revenge of the 5th, which is the day after May the 4th be with you. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about Cassini's deep dive through the rings of Saturn and Curiosity sampling a dune. What is the, co- the uh, cold spot in the CMB? Come on, Parallel Universe. Stop. <laughs> and an enormous wave sweeping through the Perseus Cluster. Joining me this week, we've got a bunch of our regulars and a bunch of new people. Uh, first up, we've got... Actually, you know what? Everyone's been here before. I take that all back. Uh, anyway, joining us this week, we've got uh, Dr. Paul Metzetter. Dr. Hey, Sutter. how's it going? Good. Glad to have you back. Uh, we've got, oh, people now can already see. We've got Nancy Atkinson. Hey, everybody. Where is she? Where is she? Come on. You got to talk a little longer, Nancy. And then, oh, and uh, what I like, Hi, is everybody, you've got like a higher resolution. Maybe it's just stuck on Paul Metzetter. Hmm. Can't get off me. <laughs> uh, I can't quit you. And so you see the, the sign that Nancy's got sort of behind her there. Uh, yeah, right there. The editor. So Nancy made me one too. So this is, you've probably seen, oh, you can't see it. Oh, well, you know the yeah, sign. I can see it. Yeah, you, they can, but the, the audience can't. Okay. Maybe, maybe no. Anyway, uh, yeah. And, so. I sh- and I should say that uh, a longtime reader of Universe Today, Tavi Greiner, made these for us. Yeah. And, yeah, they're, I, they're awesome. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, me too. They're, they're like wood and like actually chiseled out. It's really cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, rejoining us for a return visit on the Weekly Space Hangout is uh, Matthew Anderson. Matthew, welcome back. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be back. And it was about three or four months ago, I think, that I first joined. Uh, well, I've been you know, a fan of the program forever, but managed to get on uh, in January. And boy, in three or four months how the news changes, doesn't it? <laughs> well, and that was, I think, the the key to having you come back and join us this week is, is that you know you wrote a book, you you killed a bunch of trees, took words, put them into the historical archive of humanity, and now those words uh, need to be updated. So so we will find out sort of what's new and what's kind of new and relevant for the the stories that you're you're talking about in a second. But before we do, there's a very important piece of news that you all need to know about, and that is our good friend Morgan Renberg yesterday defended his doctoral thesis. He is... He is that's one. Dr. Morgan Renberg it, to you. It is. Yeah. Well, that's exactly right. Uh, he is now Dr. Morgan Renberg, which is just fantastic. I cannot wait to introduce uh, him as Dr. Morgan Renberg. Uh, so if you've got him on the Twitters, if you, uh, you know, if you're following him anywhere out there on, on the Internet, send him a congratulation. Let him know that we're thinking about him and uh, – and we understand that he he took the day off. To- I would have shown up. I would have shown up after my dissertation, Fraser. Yeah, to- <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. So, uh, so congrats, Morgan. Uh, couldn't have happened to a nicer person. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's move on to this week's. Oh, and one other thing, of course. Uh, big thanks as always to the Weekly Space Hangout crew. Uh, they are, of course, the people who run the community behind the scenes. They are the people who organize the guests to come here on the show. Couldn't do this without them. Uh, if you want to join that community, join the chat down here. Uh, go to wshcrew.space. And uh, you can get into the inside track. This is the Slack channel where we all talk and hang out. You can talk to me. Join us at wshcrew.space. All right. On with the uh, show. First, Matthew. You, yeah, so. Uh, you wrote a wow, book. It's, I, I did. Uh, in January. Uh, at, well, I shouldn't say. Yeah, I wrote a book in one month in January. It took about four years before that. That's, that's, that seems about right. How uh, so? Now it's been a couple of months since your book came out. How how's that gone for you? It's been amazing. I have actually got it, it number one uh, just again this past week. It fluctuates up and down in on Amazon rankings. Number one in the ebook version for astrophysics, uh, astronomy, 
and uh, a couple of other categories depending on the day of the week it seems have you, have you got so one I'm, kicking around can you hold it up i you know it's funny you ask that i was furiously looking for it <laughs> oh, and no. i i actually oh. have uh one from the very first edition it's probably i don't know how valuable it would be maybe a dollar more now that's a different title so i, I was going to show you that but it's a different title and it would probably confuse the viewers so all right well I'll, it, I'll dig up a, a a an electronic version i'll show that on the browser in a second um but uh yeah so so how has it been going since you released your book and i know that a lot of the news has kind of changed there's been a ton of new stuff that's happened you know. Yeah, it has. It's it's really amazing. Uh, so just as a quick recap, my book's title, Our Cosmic Story, is a, hopefully projects to all of you watching, a big picture perspective of our place in the cosmos. So the book was released in January, and it goes through several chapters, starting with Earth, why Earth is good for life, talks about evolution, then goes into civilization, drops on chapter four a pause of civilization and the risks of it and potential downfall scenarios like super volcanoes, asteroids, and pick your poison, and then moves into the the more spacey half of the book, learning about stars, planets, uh, and you know exoplanets that we have now counted in the thousands and project to be potentially in the galaxy alone, billions, and who knows how much more really, and ends with a chapter about what are the what's the potential of reaching out and finding another actual civilization, a communicating civilization that's using radio waves, light, or whatever? And that last chapter, over the months after the book was published, I thought, well, it needs a little more. That like each of these, as we were talking before the show started, each of these topics within the chapter could be about three or four books worth. So I expanded that out and released it this last week as. In, is anybody out there with a question mark, an excerpt from our cosmic story? And they're both available on Amazon. So what is the sort of the, the big stories in exoplanet research that you've been following and you're really excited about? Well, some of the things that really intrigues me is learning more about the atmospheres of these planets. Because before we can talk about is there alien life out there? We have to have some sort of common ground, some sort of base of understanding of what could support life. And we, we pretty much got that planets or maybe in some cases moons can do it. That's we're, we're here on a planet after all. So that's a good starting point. And we've learned that so many exoplanets are out there now that, that are not only in the habitable zone of their host star, but intriguingly, are in the habitable zone of stars that we didn't really realize would host planets at all. And those are the M dwarfs. And I think that's where we're with, with news over the last several weeks, seeing planets that are around these exotic stars tidally locked with their star. And we've already detected atmospheres. In fact, uh, one of those particular planets just a few weeks ago, um, I, don't want to misquote the number here because some of the, you know, how they list Galisa 667C and Kepler 452B. Uh, that one actually is around a G2B sun like star, but, you know, they have all these crazy names. And we've seen atmospheres around these, which is good news. Uh, so, how do you feel about sort of the chances for for life around, say, the, you know, the Trappist worlds, these, these M dwarf stars, these red dwarf stars? You know, we know that these star stars are very, uh, you know, they send out a lot of really powerful solar flares early on in their age. Uh, these planets are most likely tidally locked or almost certainly tidally locked to the star. Should we be looking at these places as, as sort of looking for alien civilizations? Are they habitable worlds? What do you think? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we don't know for sure if they are actually habitable uh, or more importantly, actually inhabited. But we have some indicators that are moving in the, a good positive direction, starting with, yes, there are a few planets around these M dwarf stars, a couple of the planets that are very, very close to their star that would be considered like where Mercury would be in terms of the habitable zone of our sun, way too close, too hot, but still have an atmosphere. And you mentioned like these M dwarfs, the solar flares, they're very, very active thousands of times in some cases more, especially in the early age of those stars, 
more active than larger stars like our own. And solar flares, I mentioned atmospheres. Well, solar flares can strip off very quickly within a few million years an atmosphere of a planet, especially if the atmosphere is thin. And that obviously doesn't do well for life because once you lose the atmosphere, you lose any water on the, the planet. And once you lose water, possibility of plate tectonics and cycling of the atmosphere itself with uh, carbon dioxide. And it just all shuts down if you don't have an atmosphere. You need that. And we've seen that. Uh, we've seen tant tantalizing hints that there may be water on some of these worlds. One indicator is the density of the planets. Like the TRAPPIST-1 system has several planets that are in the habitable zone. About they, they figure three are pretty solid in the zone. But they're mis really uniquely uh, lower in mass than we would have expected. And one of those things that would do that is that it has a lot of water. Uh, and so another part, I guess, you know, is, you know, you've talked about the TRAPPIST-1, about the search around MDORs, but there are a whole bunch of other worlds and a lot of other missions out there. There's the Gaia mission, there's the TESS mission, uh, upcoming missions as well. We are just going to have more planets than we we'll even know what to look at. It's, it's getting kind of crazy. Yeah, it is. That's, uh. We've got thousands that we've detected already. We've got dozens that are solid candidates for future telescopes like the James Webb and others to look at. Uh, uh, these these teams that are itching to get these new telescopes into space and some very good large telescopes. The, you had an article that you actually just uh, released, a, was it yesterday, a couple of days ago, about all these new telescopes on Earth that may have a chance to... Uh, detect these planets and so that's we're overloaded but that's great it's better than having none right yeah well we actually interviewed uh the someone from bradley peterson from uh who's worked with uh, paul in the past um about the his the louvoir telescope have you looked into this it's a 15 meter space telescope that's sort of in the in the early early planning stages right now it's going to be you know bigger than the biggest telescope that's ever been built on earth but in space so uh it's a it's a pretty exciting time uh, you know we've as you said we're running this series about all the super telescopes that are coming earth and space based it's a it's you haven't seen anything yet <laughs> yeah, one, one interesting thing about those that telescope you mentioned that we need in order to detect to get a really good solid detection of atmospheres of these ha potentially habitable worlds or any planets outside our solar system we need to really get a telescope into space there's there's some ways we can detect them with ba earth-based telescopes but with humidity and atmosphere it, it's very very difficult and one of the things uh, going back real quick to the water content of these exoplanets we need water for life at least here on earth so it's a good starting point and in, we need those space-based telescopes to really know is there water on those planets uh, we atmosphere is a little little easier to, to detect but to, to figure out water and most importantly how much water because if it has one little pond in the corner of the planet that's not going to circulate the temperature around the planet as well for carbon dioxide, the, the various, look up the carbonite, carbonite cycle, and it, it will give you a good idea of how necessary water is to help absorb carbon from a planet's atmosphere and to push that into the planet if it has plate tectonics and then eventually out again for through volcanic mechanisms. And if you have no water, you're going to probably have something like Venus. If you have 100% water, like if you've ever watched the movie Waterworld, uh, although that wasn't one hundred percent technically, but if you have basically one hundred percent, I would never use Waterworld as an example. Of yeah, a, bad you know, example of, bad, of anything. For, yeah, good good point. Um, if if you have one hundred percent water on any planet, that may spawn life. In fact, there's you know probably a good chance because water temperate right away. It's not boiling off. It's not freezing. But you're not going to build a civilization. And that's one of the keys in this excerpt that uh, is anybody out there from our cosmic story to, to, to really hit home is that, yes, we want to find life, but we really want to find civilizations, right? And without, we were talking about this a few weeks ago, without 
the ability to produce fire, easy energy catalysts, to work with tools and resources to make more complex things like electronics. I mean, just t t think about that for all the readers here and well, listeners. Think about that for a minute. If you have 100% water with the ocean possibly kilometers deep, and you know how difficult it is for us to get to the bottom of our ocean, would a budding early civilization ever be able to build rockets? Yeah, you don't see dolphins building rockets. They can't even light fires. Um, but uh, so let's talk a bit about, about you know, you've, you've started to talk about alien civilizations. I don't know if you saw, there's a really cool report that came out from Dr. Jason Wright. He'd been a guest on this show about how we might search for ancient civilizations, past, long dead, precursor civilizations here in the solar system, uh, what kinds of artifacts that we may look at, look for. It was a pretty interesting topic. I, I wrote a story about it. Um, you know, you have expanded the book. You've released a whole new section just about this search for, for extraterrestrials, the Drake equation, the Fermi paradox. Did, you know, so what spurred that? What got you to sort of add that additional material? Well, one of the things was I was looking extensively at the, you mentioned the Drake Equation, which is the start of this new book. It, it talks about what Drake's initial inputs were for that equation. And I thought about it and thought about it. And I realized that, well, one, there needed to be more to that equation, knowing that what we know now today, uh, some of the sensitivities of like M dwarf planets and other habitability conditions and so there's a lot that I talk about with that equation. I, I kind of come up with additional terms that are, you know, something that may or may not be needed, but it's it's more of a thought experiment like the original equation was anyway. And uh, I realized that there are so many roadblocks to getting to a civilization. I touched upon the water world issue. And then you get into, let's say a civilization gets into space, starts sending out communications they get past a lot of those stumbling blocks. So one one of those things is that what I'm describing here with the stumbling blocks and uh, going back to chapter five of the original book where it's the, there's the risk of falling of civilization, of the destruction of civilization, that all it is wrapped into what's called the great filter, which I liken it to multiple scenarios of destruction. And eventually as a civilization expands into space and does things, they fall to one of those. And I, I guess I guess going back to, you know, kind of what you were saying about communicating, I mean, that's really the heart of, well, if if there's civilizations out there and we can't communicate with them, and then what good is that? There are promising, let's say there's some nearby. They get through the filter, we get through the filter, and they're nearby. We can use radio waves to detect them. They can send radio waves to us. We can go a little bit more complicated and, and a little more direct and, and uh, powerful with lasers and a few other uh, promising technologies. We can do it. We can we can communicate. The problem is time is and space is so vast that it has to work out just right. We'll we'll maybe find, I suspect, one civilization within the next century if we're lucky. Uh, so we got a couple of questions that have been coming in. I thought I'd kick a few your way. Uh, this comes from uh, ML Robinson 59. Can a civilization exist underwater or is dry land a requirement? Do you think that, you know, the the European space whales will eventually be able to to light a fire and build rockets? That's a really good question. Uh, excellent question. It depends. So when I say water world, I'm not quite saying 100% certain that they can't build rockets. It, it's, there may be some scenario where the water world, especially as you, you go into super earths that are a little bit larger than Earth, the gravity is a little bit greater, which means the mountain ranges and the topography in general will be a little bit smoother. That means, consequently, that the deepest levels of the ocean on any water world would be a little bit shallower, maybe shallow enough to where a species evolves and can get to that rock, can get to those resources somehow. But they're probably going to have fins, right? They're not going to have fingers. So how do they get the rock out? Yeah. 
Um, uh, Arjun asks, would water protect life on planets near volatile stars? So they may have trouble building fires and getting rocks to bang together, but they maybe will be protected from those devastating solar flares. Yeah, that's a, another great question. Uh, short answer to the protection, yes. If there's water, it only requires, a, I, I don't remember the exact amount, but it's only a few meters, I believe. Uh, somebody feel free to correct me on that. Just a few meters yeah. of protection. Yeah. So w water worlds under a flaring star, not a problem. If the atmosphere survives to, can, to keep that water on that planet. But even if, let's say, during the early era, the first billion years of a red dwarf, furious solar flaring, where it's throwing these off daily, crazy solar flares that would do our electrical grid in, in a second, it pushes off or, or it erodes the atmosphere. Well, if that atmosphere started on, say, a super Earth that was holding a quite a thick atmosphere, say something like Venus, it would erode that to maybe the point where it would be thin enough and consequently eroding the, the the water that manages to escape into the atmosphere and get split apart to just the right balance to where the oceans that were once kilometers thick are now only a few feet thick. It, it just depends. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so we've got a couple more questions here. Um, from Raza Siddiqui, do you think there could be an intelligent life which could withstand extreme conditions like on Venus or on other planets? I mean, it's sort of starting to move towards this idea of life not as we know it, but life as we don't know it. Yeah, that's uh, that's where we get into check out the Drake equation. And uh, if you get my book, look up the extra uh, points about it. It's plug in your own numbers because we're, we're getting into that territory where we really just don't know. Uh, I can say a couple of things about it to maybe uh, focus it a little bit. Carbon is, there's very good reasons for why carbon is a good start because it can bond with other elements into very long chains quite easily. And most importantly, or just as importantly, it can break those chains to recombine as well. That's one of the very, very few elements that can really do this well at a relatively low energy cost. Another one would be sulfur requires a little more energy. So maybe there's sulfur life forms out there. Uh, I remember a couple of Star Trek episodes uh, on some sort of sulfur rock creature, I think they said. I think it felt uh, pain, as I recall. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, who knows. Um, there are definitely limits, though. We can't we can't just say anything's possible because look at our own solar system. We know that's not the case. Well, let's do a a quick survey now. Just uh, where do you stand? Is the, are there intelligent civilizations? Where do you stand on the Fermi paradox in the Drake equation? Make your make your place your bets. Yeah, if you, where do you think? Do you think yeah. there are, do you think there are aliens in the, uh, out there in the Milky Way? Or do you think the, the great filter is, uh, kills them all? Yeah, I thought, I thought we were doing a, uh, the chat. I would be interested in knowing what you guys think is, of that as well. The percentage, I'd say 100, I'd say as close to 100% as you could be without being absolutely certain because we can't be absolutely mm -hmm. certain mm -hmm. right now. The, the, the universe well, forget the universe. Let's just focus on the galaxy. The galaxy is so vast, and there's so much time for a planet to, as the sun ages and the planet ages, it gets to just the right stage to, to spawn, to evolve life on its surface. And eventually, after a civilization grows and, you know, gets falls through multiple wars and whatnot, it gets into space eventually, and unless it blows up the planet or something. But then that's their problem, I suppose. One of those. So, out of, so you think they're out there? They are. They, you're, they're you're absolutely. hundred percent certain. All right. That's good. As certain as I can be. I mean, there's yep. too much to, yep. to say no to that. Paul Metzetter, where do you stand? On intelligent life in our galaxy? Yeah. Is there any out there or not? Uh, is there any here? <laughs> well, I mean, so, so maybe there's no intelligent life in the, the whole universe? Touche. Uh, uh, actually, that raises a very slightly interesting side question of, you know, is intelligence like kind of like a, a binary thing where, you know, you're sentient and then that's it? Or is there various gradations of sentience uh, that we would not recognize or would not recognize us? I don't know, uh, because I'm just a humble astrophysicist. 
but uh, yeah, I agree with Matthew. Uh, Galaxy is a big place, been around for a while, happened here, happened somewhere else. We're never going to talk to it, though. Nancy. Oh, yeah, 100%. I agree with Matthew. Uh, but I'm just kind of curious about what the, you know, all the possibilities for life that we wouldn't maybe recognize. And I think that's, I think there's, there's a big possibility for that. And I kind of agree with, uh, with Paul too, is that I don't think we're going to be able to communicate. I think there's, er, there's potential for civilizations that are much less uh, developed. Um, Probably I think a potential for much less developed rather than more developed. I agree with you, Nancy. I, I just want to build on that real quick on one quick point. It, it's not so much the stage they're at or that there are other civilizations or especially light-filled worlds, probably like 100 times light-filled worlds versus civilizations or whatever. It's the time and space problem. It's the, they pop up here, last for 200 years, get destroyed just as our radio waves go by and is constantly doing that. Nobody ever meets because of that. Well, I suspect people know what I think, which is that the Fermi paradox freaks me out, and uh, and I I am a little concerned about the Great Filter personally. Um, so uh, before we we're going to let you go in a second. I know you got to get back to uh, to work, but uh, but people who are interested in your new book can pick it up free over the weekend, right? Yeah, that's right. So uh, you can get the main book that came out in January, Our Cosmic Story, or get the new one, Is Anybody Out There, an excerpt to Our Cosmic Story. Just search on Amazon for those. In fact, I'll, uh, I'll throw a link in the chat here. So, can, so specifically, is, is the, the, the new edition is the one that's free over the weekend or both? Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, thank you for reminding me. It's free. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah, the new edition is free. The uh, original book is it's still on sale. So. You want to still get that? Yeah. So the update is free, but the original version is still for sale. Okay. Well, so yeah. yeah. So it's the entire book. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. So go to. Uh, we've actually got a link on the Weekly Space Hangout uh, Crew website. Go to w- wshcrew dot space, and there should be a link right from the homepage that'll show you how you can get a copy of 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 Matthew's book for free, uh, including the the updated information. How long is this going to be available for if, if people are? Uh, yeah, let me correct on that one point. I said it, it's not free on Amazon, but like you said, if you go and you make a note that you were on the Space Hangout yeah. uh, watching it, I will give you the original free as well. So all free, free, free. Free, free, all good. free. So yep, just go. It's Friday free. Why not? <laughs> there you go. It's the Revenge of the yeah. yeah, and it'll be available until uh, Nancy. We, I think we had the cutoff on next it was next week sometime but do it this weekend just okay safe. so now's your chance so make sure you go to wshcrew.space there'll be a link there download matthew's book for free there you go there's the hard sell uh matthew always a pleasure to have you joining us here on the weekly space hangout uh please uh come back again in the future when uh, when there's all kinds of new big updates and you've got more books to give away <laughs> absolutely i love it i hope everybody enjoyed it and i'll see you guys later all right we'll see you later man all right so once again i just want to remind everybody uh one if you haven't already take a moment send a tweet to morgan underscore renberg uh with a some kind of congratulatory tweet so that he knows that uh we're congratulating him on becoming a doctor and from this point forward he will always be Dr. Morgan Remberg to all of us. Uh, as well, join the WCH crew if you want to join this chat down here and sort of really get the behind the scenes totally free. And this is the Slack community that we use to organize this show. All right, let's get on with the news. What do I want to think about? Uh, Paul Metzetter, I want to know how the cold spot in the cosmic microwave background is or is not a portal to an another universe well too bad because we don't know no and that's it Uh, welcome welcome to modern astronomy now here's the thing the cosmic microwave background the leftover light uh, from the early universe uh when we look at it's uniform to one part in ten thousand across all parts of the sky but we can look at those tiny tiny differences and we can look for hot spots and cold spots and the hot spots and cold spots tell us about 
the structure of the very early universe. So it really is like a baby picture of the universe. And the hot spots and cold spots follow a very particular statistical pattern. And there's one particular spot, a little region. It's not the coldest part. It's not the biggest part. But the combination of its particular coldness and its particular largeness makes it pretty unique. And when we look at it just, you know, what are the chances of a random fluctuation giving us a spot like that? It's like, it's pretty small. It's like less than 1%. So we're wondering what's going on. Uh, something had to, something special is happening in that part of the universe. So either there's something really interesting happening in the early universe that generates that cold spot, or something is happening to the light as it goes from the CMB to the Earth over the past 13.8 billion years. In that particular line of sight, something funky is happening to the light. So this was a pretty big debate for a while, and a few years ago, some researchers uh, thought they put a, a lid on this because they looked, they did a galaxy survey in the line between us and the cold spot, and they found a few very, very large cosmic voids. These are the vast expanses of almost absolutely nothing sitting between uh, clusters of galaxies, and these voids can affect the light from the CMB in a very, very subtle way. Light from the CMB enters the void. Then over the course of time, the void gets bigger. And then when the light exits, it actually gets cooled down just a little bit. This is called the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect for the cosmology aficionados listening. And we thought that was it. Oh, it just happens to be there's a big void in our universe and, and we're looking through that void to the CMB and that gives us a cold spot. And as a person who studies cosmic voids, that I'm sure made you happy. I was totally happy. Uh, actually, I was a little bummed because I wasn't part of that work uh, and that was pretty nice work. But <laughs> a little bit jealous. Um, but recently... The, some new researchers and some of the original researchers did a new galaxy survey, getting some more galaxies, getting some more details. And they're saying mm, there is a void there, but it's not big enough to explain the cold spot. So there's a lot of ambiguity around the cold spot, around the analysis, around their conclusions about the significance of the cold spot, because uh, maybe it is just random chance. Maybe it is something funny happening in the early universe, like another bubble uh, universe uh, rubbing up against our own. Uh, maybe it's something more mundane. We're not exactly sure what's going on with this cold spot. And there's no... I mean, the, the, I guess the point is is that to have it form, have a place that is that vastly different of a temperature, although it's, you know, it's it's a very tiny difference in temperature. It's just that the the equipment is so sensitive to be able to detect it. Yes. But to have something that is that that different, you should that just shouldn't be possible. It's yeah, it's not that it shouldn't be possible, but the normal physics that happened in the early universe that uh, explains the pattern on the CMB and our large scale structure in the universe. Something funny was happening in that patch, or there's something funny happening between us and that patch. Maybe the patch is totally normal, but something happened to the light between us, or it's just random fluke. Maybe it is just, you know, weird stuff happens and that's life. Um, got a question here from Arjone. How much bigger would our universe have to be for the spot to be a normal variation? So could it be a normal variation if the universe were a different scale? Uh, yes. If the statistics of the cosmic microwave background followed a different pattern uh, than the statistics that we do know, uh, it's it's not so much about uh, like the size of our universe. It's just... Uh, it's like, uh, let's see, if you're rolling a die um, and you get, uh, say, 100 ones in a row. Yes, that is a possible chance. Or say you're flipping a coin and you get 100 heads in a row. 
Yes, that is a likely outcome or that is a possible outcome, but it's not a likely outcome. So having this cold spot, uh, it's, it's just a little bit too unlikely to happen. Very cool. Uh, well, this is good. I mean, my hopes for having a parallel universe bumping right up to our own universe, it's back on the table. Back on the table. It's back on the menu. We nice. thought we thought we had killed that idea and dashed all your hopes and dreams. Yeah. But we're giving you one back. Well, get back to work. I'm sure you will come back to finally and fully dash my hopes and dreams. Yeah, check 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 me out in a year or so. All right. Uh, okay, uh, Nancy, let's uh, let's talk about the uh, c- the deep dive that Cassini yeah. did. Yeah, Cassini has now made two dives in between the gap between Saturn and its rings, and uh, going where no spacecraft has gone before. I'm gonna and... play some some video here while you're uh, while you're talking, so people can see. Yeah, it. this yeah, the, some of the the pictures and the video have been nothing short of stunning. And if you aren't already following people like Jason Major or Kevin Gill or Sophia Nasser, uh, they're doing quickly doing. Uh, image editing and and getting these uh, uh, processed raw images out there. Of course, you can go to the Cassini raw image page and get get the pictures uh, in their raw state immediately, almost. So, but yeah, so it, it's been exciting. Uh, of course, there's a good news, bad news kind of thing here, even though Cassini's going in an exciting place that we haven't gone before. This means that the mission is getting closer to its ultimate end, which is very, very sad. So it's been a 13-year mission. Uh, studying Saturn and its rings and all the moons, and uh, it's running out of fuel. So they need to uh, crash the spacecraft into Saturn eventually. This will happen in September, and because uh, they don't want it crashing into any potentially habitable moons like Enceladus or Titan, because there could possibly be some Earth microbes left on the on the spacecraft. So... And this is, I mean, as you said, they've now done their second fly through this region. There's what, 19 more to come? Yeah, yep. There's, uh, yeah, 22 in total. So, uh, yeah, so, so 20 left. Yep. Yeah. And <laughs> just do the math. <laughs> do the math. All the we just carry the three. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah, so uh, I think that the thing that I thought was so cool, so they're, they were pretty certain that this gap wasn't full of, like, debris and dust, but, you know, it's possible. And so, you know, they're using this last these last months of the mission to do things that they would never attempt to do uh, at any other time. So uh, to, to just just in case, you know, they were going to run into any dust particles or anything, they, they turned the, the deflector, the... the uh, communications dish around as a deflector shield as as it was going through through this gap i think that's hilarious but also really cool and uh but um they did find on the on the first dive that there was less dust than they were expecting you know it's it's going at about 125,000 kilometers per hour uh, relative to saturn and even a like a smoke smoke sized dust particle uh could have disabled the spacecraft if it hit in the right place or the wrong place so um, now there's so finding that there's less dust i mean that's it's perplexing in a way but also exciting because it's uh, a higher probability that the spacecraft will survive all of these 22 dives well that's what i was wondering right is that if having made this first couple of dives they know that it's able to do this safely will they be more aggressive try to bring the spacecraft in closer to the surface of saturn try to maybe extract more science out of it as they as they continue on these missions are they going to stick to the current flight plan i i think they kind of have to stick to the current flight plan uh because they you know the orbital dynamics orbital mechanics are kind of already you know being processed or already already been processed so um yeah but you know there's a few things that they're trying to figure out you know we don't know the mass of the rings we we just know the mass of saturn and its rings total and knowing the mass of the rings will tell us a lot of things as far as like how the rings were formed or how long they've been around that kind of thing that we that we really don't know yet 
And there's also some things that they want to find out about Saturn. So like the internal rotation rate and other kinds of things that you can only get this kind of data when you're really up close to the planet. So there's kind of a, a mystery about how long Saturn's year is. So when the Voyager and, and Pioneer missions went, went flying by, they kind of got a general idea. But once Cassini was insert, inserted into orbit, the data that was coming back about Saturn's internal rotation was that it's about oh, the day, the the length of yeah, the, the day. day. Yeah, the day. Yes. Yeah. So so they're uh, they're trying to figure that out, and hopefully this will help us figure that out. Yeah, I'm. I mean, we'll keep on reporting, but it's funny to think about, right? Between now and September fifteenth. There will be another, whatever, 19, 20 more flybys. We will have a couple of these going every week when we return, you know. Actually, you know what? We're not because we're going to be going on our breaks. We'll get back after in September and they'll be like, and then Cassini will crash. So I take it all back. We're about to stop talking about it. And then there'll be a bunch of news right at the end. Uh, We'll keep reporting it on Universe today, though. Perfect. There you go. Uh, All right. uh, Paul, let's talk about... uh, this hot gas this tsunami found rolling through the perseus galaxy cluster oh i like that word tsunami yeah a tsunami of hot gas bigger than the milky way i'm gonna uh, yeah. again i'm gonna play some cool video while you talk that's fine by me do you want me to like use a narrator voice no 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 please perseus cluster no, the uh, so all galaxy clusters are big assemblages of galaxies, like beehives of galaxies, each containing a thousand or more galaxies. Uh, but it's not just made of galaxies; uh, linked kind of sw- uh, the galaxies are swimming in a very, very hot but very, very thin plasma called the intracluster medium. And when two galaxy clusters collide, which happens more often than you think the centers uh, the the massive galaxies at the centers of the galaxy clusters uh, orbit each other crash into each other and these these sets up uh, sloshing patterns uh, in the intracluster medium and the sloshing patterns uh, can be emitted in kind of a spiral fashion kind of radiating out from the center and what observers have detected here or think they've detected here by comparing observations to computer simulations of galaxy cluster mergers is the presence of what's called the Kelvin Helmholtz instability. This happens when you have two kinds of fluids up against each other and one of the fluids is moving faster than the other. You get little waves. So if you've ever seen a wind blow against the surface of water and generate waves, that's exactly what you're seeing. We see this exact same thing uh, in clouds. We see it in uh, Jupiter. And we might be seeing the biggest ones of all in this galaxy cluster where you have this sloshing at the center that's kind of stirring, uh, mixing up the center, making the center of the gas move faster than the outer parts and this sets up instabilities and you're getting these giant waves. So isn't that a wonderful application of the universality of physics that uh, the wind over the ocean, exact same physics, these giant waves bigger than the Milky Way. I mean, I think about the you know with say spiral galaxies like the like the milky way you've got these gravi- gravitational or gravity waves pressure waves that yeah move, the density waves the density yeah. waves sorry that move through the galaxy that it's mm-hmm. not actually like the spiral arms of a galaxy are not actually stars moving in these these right. spiral patterns yeah the spiral arms are only like 10% more dense than average right right but that that the stars take their turn like a traffic jam in the bunching up that forms the spiral arms that that we can see. So it's a sort of a similar situation that it's that you're seeing this kind of, you know, this bunching up of material that's sort of passing through. Like yeah, pressure. this is uh, literally a cold front, just like a cold front on a weather map where you have a mass of higher pressure or lower pressure, colder air rubbing up against a mass of higher, uh, higher pressure, hotter air. And there's a boundary between those two because, you know, they're kind of fighting each other. It's exactly the same physics. There's a boundary between two different states of gas 
And that boundary has instabilities in it that generate waves and vortices. It's a, I think the, you know, the best part is just these simulations showing us what these look like. And this, you know, to be able to see these kinds of huge structures moving these, you know, we think of the universe as these separate galaxies out there, you know, they're, they're in these sort of larger structures, but we don't sort of imagine those those interactions, but even at the yeah. largest scales. Yeah, you're looking at these simulations and you're like, oh, that's cute. That's a cool uh, swirly thing these, there. These, these are fast forwarding through hundreds of millions of years of evolution of these galaxy mergers or cluster mergers, sorry. Right, yeah, these aren't just individual galaxies. These are whole clusters. Coming these are the together. most massive, most uh, most massive objects in the universe, the most energetic collisions, the most violent things that happen in our universe. And we're sitting here going, oh, pretty picture. Yeah, that's, look, look at that swirly. Oh, yeah, oh, that's a whole wave that makes a swirly. Yeah, <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, Nancy, let's get an update on uh, what's happening on Mars. Yeah, Curiosity rover, kind of exciting, is uh, doing some more sampling. Using uh, It's going to be using its onboard uh, chemistry lab to kind of analyze some sand dunes that it's been, been driving past. You might remember um, about a year and a half ago, it was driving by these huge dunes, 30 feet tall bo- dunes in the Bagnall dunes. And it's still actually along that same uh, field of dunes, uh, but Interestingly enough, so the dunes that that it was driving by in uh, in 2016, they were like crescent-shaped dunes. These dunes are more linear, and so the team really wants to figure out what, why are these dunes different, even though they're in the same dune field. So they're going. They took a, took a sample, and they're going to be testing it later. They're uh, decided to to gather the the sand, and then um, we'll be putting it in the the chemistry lab, the SAM chemistry lab later, they're going to do a little more driving right now. Um, they've had some issues with um, some of the, in, uh, some of the equipment on board the, the drill isn't working right now, or there's a potential problem with the drill of, of it shorting out. And so they, they really want to use it sparingly. So they're not doing that. Uh, the, the one instrument that would really kind of help them figure this out would be the wind instrument, but that uh, hasn't been working since about uh, for a couple of years. So, you know, I mean, one, of the, <laughs> one of the things that's really quite fascinating about Mars is that you do have this active dunes. It's very similar to the kinds of structures that you see even here on here on Earth on beaches uh you know you go to a beach and the dunes are often or the the smaller dunes the ripples in the sand are caused by the water action there's other the ones that are caused by the wind what does examining these kinds of structures on mars help scientists understand well for one thing they want to know more about the the chemical makeup of the sand or or in the just what constitutes it, what makes it up, and why is it so dark? These dunes are really, really dark. Uh, the other thing is just learning more about the atmosphere. We know that it, it there's windstorms on Mars, but we don't really completely understand how, you know, is there going to be a, a Mark Watney-style windstorm uh, that would potentially be a problem for astronauts. But we we do know that the, uh, the atmosphere is a lot thinner, so you can we don't think that there can be those kind of windstorms. Yeah, and one thing as well, I sort of was was showing the the picture. You can see, I, I think that's Mount Sharp in the background, isn't it? Of the of that panorama, the one that's that sort of yeah, shows there, the whole. You can there, s- the, yeah, the rover now is on kind of the northwestern flank of the of the of the mountain of Mount Sharp, uh, making its way up. We're going to start being able to look at some of those layers, um, those sedimentary layers that should tell us more about the history of Mars, which is what we want to know. How's the rover holding up right now? I know, you know, you were covering a bit on how its wheels were doing. There was some definitely some some wear and tear on its wheels. How's how's the whole rover doing? Uh, I think it's doing pretty well overall. But, yeah, you know, it's. It's it's it got some wear and tear on the wheels. There's some gnashes, gashes and tears and that kind of thing. So, if you don't have wheels that 
that's you know that's that's tough to row if you don't have uh, stable wheels. I can imagine it sort of like trying to walk, drag. Would well, you remember? I mean, so sad. Do you remember? What was it was it Spirit Opportunity? One of them, its wheels busted, and so it turned around. And it was dragging a bad wheel behind it. Yeah, I think that was opportunity, and they are actually driving Curiosity backwards every once in a while. But they are trying to drive differently. There was some kind of sharper, pointier rocks that they went over, and I think they didn't realize how damn it, how much damage the, that those rocks were causing. So they're they're trying to drive uh, kind of a little gentler, maybe would be a way to phrase it. But they are driving backwards sometimes too. And I wonder if there are any issues in in like are they going to actually go out onto that sand and try to cross that that gulf? I mean, are there any issues in driving in that kind of material as opposed to the the rock that gives you a bit of more of a firmer grip? Well, the one thing they don't want to do is get stuck in a sand dune because yeah. you know that that happened to Spirit and that was the end of the mission. So, yeah, I think it's a kind of a a fine line to walk as far as or a fine line to rove, whatever you want to say. Um, a, you know, trying to avoid the hazards that you can, but still drive through the most interesting areas. Fantastic. Well, I think we're reaching the end of this hour. Time to wrap things up. Uh, so why don't we do that? Uh, let's start with uh, with you, Nancy, because I've still got you on my screen here. Uh, first, before we do, though, I don't know if you have one kicking around. I happen to keep a copy of your book on my desk at all times just in case i need another incredible story from space um yep. how's how's that going you've been doing a bunch of publicity for your book what's happening yeah i've been busy traveling around and going to different places and doing presentations at schools and libraries and a couple of book festivals it's been really fun meeting a lot of people and it's, it's been great seeing how enthusiastic people are about space exploration and astronomy Will and... you ever write another book? Did it did it ruin you for writing books like writing books ruined me? <laughs> um, no, I think there's the potential for yeah. uh, another book coming awesome. up. So I'll, I'll keep you posted on that. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah, if you want to learn about the uh, kind of the inside stories of some of these great planetary missions uh like the mars rover the new horizons mission yes incredible stories i had talked to 37 nasa scientists and engineers and they told me all sorts of great stories about these missions fantastic uh paul matt sutter how's it going where do people find out more oh uh, they can follow me on twitter and facebook at Paul Matt Sutter. Uh, also, my website, pmsutter.com, has links to all my education outreach initiatives, including my own podcast, askaspaceman.com. Now, as people know, uh, Dr. Sutter and I are going to Iceland. And we invited all of you. And we invited all of you to join us. And uh, But space is running up. What have they got? Like, There's like four slots left now? There's like four seats left. So, And we've just started going around to all the people who are interested but haven't signed up yet, like kind of reminding them it's time, it's time to sign up. But this is your last chance really to get on board to the trip. So I encourage you to go to astrotouring.com. And let me just, I'll bring that website up so people can see. There we go. Look at that. The Iceland Aurora Excursion. Seven mm -hmm. days, Iceland. We're going to see auroras, geysers, continental rift, waterfalls, vistas, more science. You're going to hang you and me. And and I, I'm not sure if this is a draw or if this is a repellent, but Dr. Paul Madsetter and I will be there with you taking pictures, geeking out, uh, really appreciating the uh, everything that Iceland has to offer. So there you go. We're... We're almost out of time. So if you're in any way interested, go to astrotouring.com and we'll have more information. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us this week on the Weekly Space Hangout. Uh, once again, final reminder, if you want a free copy of Matthew's book, go to wshcrew.space. There'll be a link on the front. You can go and, and download it for free. Uh, I think people were talking about it in the chat that it ends... When does it end? Like Tuesday? So you've got just a couple of days to, to get the book. 
Second, uh, if you want to join the community, though, definitely go to WSH Crew dot space and you can get behind the scenes just it's free just just request uh, an invite and you'll be able to join us here and this is where we chat talk about the upcoming shows things like that we're going to go on to do astronomy cast in 30 minutes you'll want to go over to the astronomy cast channel to to do that we're going to be talking about robots we talked about animals in space for three episodes now we're going to talk about robots in space so go ahead and join me and dr pamela gay and we'll get going with that all right Thanks everyone. Let's let's get the proper Brady Bunch view again. There's all of us. Thanks everyone for joining us and we'll see you all next week. Have a good weekend. Can I stop waving? You can stop waving right.